Um, Professor Haddy is a recognised and provocative thinker on educational reform and learning innovation, and we're very lucky to have him with us here this morning. His title of his talk is The State of Education in Australia, Opportunities, Tensions and the Future. Please make John welcome. Well, it's great to be home. It's great to be able to speak to Victorian principals. And uh, I also have three pieces of housekeeping. The first is really interesting listening to Judy's comments. Therefore, I am to be short, sharp, and give you glimmers. I also have a, um, a handout here to say that the handout of my presentation this morning is available at the MGS stand. If you, have, if you anticipate having hard to staff teaching vacancies next year, you may be interested to find more about the MGSE Secondary Internship Program. And if you visit that stand, you can be in the draw to win Steve Dunham's new book. I've done my duties. It feels a bit like I also may have had to have had a, a dream last night. Um, in some ways it's a, a bad dream, but there's a good outcome. And my theme this morning is about the opportunity that we have here in Australia at the moment and in Victoria to truly make a difference to the grammar of what we do in education. I want to argue this morning that more of the same won't do the trick. I want to argue this morning that one of our biggest responsibilities is to educate our parents. They are the voters. They are the ones that the government listens to. It's easy blaming the politicians. But as some of you know, I've switched to the dark side a couple of years ago in terms of my role now as a cabinet appointment, hitting up Aitzel and sitting on that side of the table and hearing various principal groups. Like it's really an intriguing question to consider how many groups in Australia, like that, claim to represent principals. Anyone have any idea what that number is? On the last count, there's 62 of you. It is no surprise that when you sit on the other side of the table, all you have to do is wait, and you'll all fight against each other, you'll all claim to represent, and you'll all walk away, and nothing much happens. With that amount of division, it's easy to ignore. So how do we as a group get together with a common narrative to make the case about what really matters and what's worth fighting for in our schools? I want to argue here today that we're chasing the same academic pot of gold in a market that being academic, high achievement, is the prime indicator of market value. Now come on, who could possibly not want high achievement? Well, I'm not sure I completely do. Because of this searching for this academic pot of gold in the marketplace, <clears throat> there's limited incentives for schools to change from what they've been doing and been doing for the last 150 years. And we have to seriously ask, is that what is needed? And having had four boys who have successfully navigated your system, thank you, and now in their 20s and early 30s, the concept of a, a ladder of a career does not exist. The concept of short-term jobs do exist. And what I struggle with, being an older person, is that's not what I was used to. And as I talk to my boys, they keep reminding me, they're quite happy in their world, thank you very much. They know how to cope with the fact they're going to change their career eight times. They know there isn't a ladder that you get onto and work out and go up. You move. And they're moving dramatically around the world, which is very sad given my first grandchild is now not here in Australia anymore. So this notion of what we're training them for is quite different. And when I look at what we still claim to value at our high schools, each one of us kind of went through that system. 
The problem I see is because of those two first issues, government schools are forced to privilege an academic curriculum to compete, particularly for that little sector of parents who are very keen to look around and discuss at their dinner tables and their tea parties the nature of school differences. It's forced us to have this absurd debate about school choice, which still is rampant in our system. It's forced, as Stephen Lamb and Richard Teese have shown very clearly, leading to a major residualisation in our, particularly our government school sector as more of the middle to brighter students start to drift out. And I remind you here in Melbourne that something like 60% of students pass the local school to go to another school. What an absurd thing it's done to the bus timetables and the streets in Melbourne because of this debate about school, uh, school choice. And this has led to more low socioeconomic status kids going to our government schools and facing greater obstacles. Perversely, as I want to show you this morning, it's also led to more cruising schools. And I want to argue that Australia has amongst the largest number of cruising schools and cruising kids in the world. And because of this, we are in decline. And if you don't believe me we're in decline, hang around a minute. I've got bad news and good news. Instead, I'm asking you to join to reboot, to change the narrative, in fact, to capture the narrative of what really we do need to invest in in this business called schools. And how we can put much more emphasis on supporting teachers' work. Now, I, know all, I know all of you do that now, but I'm talking about a major influx of funds and attention to the nature of what teachers' work is. To changing the rhetoric from high achievement to asking that every kid deserves at least a year's growth for a year's input. And having a common understanding of what that means, both amongst our teachers, across our schools, and amongst our students, and particularly our parents. Because one of my major themes is that success is all around us. We have some stunning schools where the majority of students do get at least a year's growth for a year's input. But my fear is we're losing it because we're not focusing on that which matters. And clearly that which matters is this notion of expertise. Why is it that we as a profession continually deny our expertise? Oh no, it wasn't us, the kids did the work. Oh, it was the resources. Oh, it was what's happening in the school, etc., etc. We have some pretty impressive experts. And I want to talk this morning about how we can change that and how some states are already starting to do that, but it doesn't yet include Victoria. How we can open up our classrooms to seeing this expert expertise and using our most proficient to make that different. Evidence. It's been around a while. It should be the most contested word. There's evidence that comes from the articles that People like you, when you're doing theses, etc., right in the academic world, there's evidence that teachers have of their expertise. And it ain't all equal. And certainly, you cannot survive in the world where funding is debated with that evidence on the table. And it's really interesting sitting on alongside ministers hearing what their views of evidence are, and it ain't yours. And how do we need to change that to feed them the nature of where success is, what it is, and how it's a function of this expertise? And also, I'm very pleased to see that your organisation has a major mission to help educate those parents, particularly by looking at your graduates. With my teacher education hat on, we spend a lot of time now trying to follow our students after they leave us, partly because Team Ag and Axel are now insisting that teacher education providers provide evidence that their graduates can change the learning lives of students, which means we have to follow them through. Turns out they're also, many of them, amongst our best advocates. And so I was delighted to hear that your organisation's got a bit of a mission 
to start to form an association at your school level about your graduates. Not always easy to find, as we know, but wow, what a powerful voice to educate the community. And coming here this morning at my Uber, the Uber driver was waxing lyrical about a particular teacher he had. And I was thinking, now, if everybody could do that every day, we would be in quite a different world. I just want to put to you five goals. And my plea to you as an organisation is never have more than three. I've got five, so choose whichever three you want. And hammer away at those as your major foci. How we have to build confidence. Like, it's really intriguing, and I know we don't have Gallup polls here, and the limited ones we do do reflect what happens in the US. In the US, 80% of adults argue that the quality of education in America is going backwards. And 80% of adults argue that the quality of education they and their kids had is pretty good. How do we feed the latter and not allow the, the former to dominate as it does? And everyone in the education system, that's ah, too strong. Many in the education system that I meet can tell me what the problem is. There's always that school down the road. How do we turn that around and build the confidence that we have a damn good system? As we do, as you'll see. The one that's probably not as relevant to you is this real issue that if kids don't get minimum levels of reading and mathematics by age eight, they virtually never catch up. I could go into great detail about the research we've done on that, but it's a pretty scary story. And it does mean that we really do need to start where it matters, between the ages of zero and two, which is where a lot of our work is now focused. If kids don't get language in those first two years, it's tough to see how they ever catch up. By the time they, they, they get to you, it's a very difficult job, particularly as schools who have these kids find ways to teach these kids without teaching them to read or to do basic numbers. Not much good when they hit your secondary schools. The evidence that schools are inviting places to learn. The retention problem, which I want to come back to this morning. And the one that's really difficult to even raise in this country. How do we break the canon of the upper high school curriculum and assessment? How do we break it to allow other ways for kids to be excellent in years 11 and 12? And I want to come back to that. And this notion of expertise, and certainly one of my missions, is to work to the point of how every school can have at least one highly accomplished and lead teacher in every school. So as I said, any three of those will do. And I hope as an organisation, you take one or two and you make that as a priority. Because here's the evidence. We are amongst the world's biggest losers. You may not like PISA, but PISA measures probably very reliably maths, reading and science. And if you don't like it, the sector loves it. And surely you, you should argue that they're not bad things that we should be aiming for. And we're one of the few countries of the world that systematically over the last 16 years has gone backwards. It should be a major wake-up call. I struggle to get anyone to care about it. Oh, yeah, we know about that. Move on. Come to my school. It's brilliant. The results are due out in December. It'll be interesting to see where we go. It'll be interesting if it's another one-day wonder. So we are amongst the world's biggest losers. Hey, Victoria. Sorry, New South Wales. Minus 23% going backwards. And my solution is simple. Let's give New South Wales to New Zealand. <laughs> you said that New South Wales can play cricket. It's down everywhere. There's no ray of hope when you look at the overall planning in terms of where we're going. Look at the countries are improving, and they've gone up 44 points, etc., etc. And Everybody loves to look at these and say, what's the difference between these and the next slide, which are the biggest losers? And I put it to you, one of the biggest differences when I look at all those countries is each one of those countries is focused on expertise. As opposed to, the best news of the day, we're not the world's biggest loser, we're the world's third, fifth, uh, fifth biggest loser. But those countries are obsessed with structural solutions. 
how we come up with different kinds of schools, different kinds of curricula, different kinds of assessments, all the things that are peripheral that we collectively ask for. Because it certainly allows us then to be left alone. I'm sorry. We can go up, like those countries, if we focus on expertise. And if you go to those countries and hear their debates, they're quite different to the ones we have in the sector here, which, as I say, is, is focused on structural issues. Just give us more money. Just give us more this. Just give us more that. Just leave us alone. That is the dominant there. And I particularly look at some of the top ones there, which are starting to move more into private partnerships, private public partnerships. And Sweden, which is a, a basket case, is now struggling to know how to get out of it. They went to the extreme where they sold schools to private owners, but they never put a clause on it like England did. England has a clause on theirs that if you don't succeed after 25 years, you have to give it back to the government. Wow. Wow. And I have news for everybody who thinks the answer is a new kind of school, an academy, a trust, a charter. Within six months of opening, you're running a school. It doesn't make a difference. Except if you're in troubles, then there's very little ways to get out of those systems. We're driving down maths and science participation. Now, there has been, in my estimation in Australia over the last 10 years, trillions of dollars spent trying to solve this problem. Trillions. And the majority of it is giving scholarships to people or making it easier for the bright, bright students to go into maths and science, which has not added hardly a single teacher or kid to doing maths and science. They wouldn't have done it anyway. The biggest issue we have to face in the maths and science is that next group of students, that next large group of students. And certainly I think the message we need to change is that the current message is if you're bright, if you're smart, we want you to do maths and science. Well, they're doing it anyway. In fact, some of our smarter students realise that the payoff from doing law and business is a lot higher than doing maths and science, where the jobs are going down, where sometimes you have to spend 8 to 15 years in a lab before you get any chance of having some success in being maths and science. And the thing that most intrigues me is when you look at the, the jobs in maths and science, it is down. But if you're a maths and science graduate with no social skills, it's a chasm. If you're a maths and science student with social skills, it's up. The community out there wants interpreters, communicators, team players. What's it like in your school? Do your kids sit alone? Well, actually, that's not true. Do they sit in groups and work alone? Do they do their tests alone? is the message all the time. You're in this by yourself. Where is that communication? It's a totally different kind of teaching to a lot of what I see in maths and science. And when I take the second issue, where the number of brighter students, that top percentage is not increasing in the, anyway, how do we get that next group? We're going to have to find ways to say to students that every kid Love, can love the struggle of maths and science. Now, you might want a better word than struggle, but my point is, it's not just for the top students. It isn't just for those who have the greatest memory span and remember all the chemical formulas and physics or whatever. It is about the love of learning of maths and science, which any kid at any age, at any part of their normal distribution, can follow. So how do we convince our maths and science community that they're not the elite, that the students don't have to be the elite? Because of that kind of mentality thinking, that kind of graph will continue. We need to change how we think about who can succeed in maths and science. And this overall focus on school differences, which I would argue is killing us. Yes, we are feeding the parents' myths and beliefs that they have the right to choose schools. What an incredible distraction that is. The year 2000, Australia had amongst the lowest between school variants in the world. Take two kids of the same ability, it did not matter what school they went to. So why do we have this crazy debate about school choice? If we were true 
to the evidence, if the between school variance is small, the within the school variance is large. Why haven't we given parents the right to choose the teachers? Now, I know that's got all kinds of problems with it, but my point is, we've had this massive distraction about what doesn't matter. We've caused 60% of kids in Melbourne to pass the local school on the basis of parents having the right to choose. It does not matter. They think it has. You now feed that myth, and I find it remarkable that you are asked in all kinds of perverse ways to be successful on the number of students you steal from the local schools. It doesn't make sense to me. And it's feeding the message to parents actually believe. And when they don't get the realisation that they'd hoped for, guess who they blame? Now, I'm not sure we'll ever bring zoning back in again, so I'm not sure that's the answer. But I certainly think we have to find ways to be more collaborative about how we share our schools, how we break down that annual August run to try and get those numbers up and to create this myth that our school somehow is unique and different. Now, on the other hand, in some ways you've been successful. Our between school variance is increasing. Not yet to alarming rates, but the minute you get large school differences, you do get massive residualisation. That's what the difference means. I'm not sure as a country we can afford that, to have the haves and the have-nots. We have to make every school, particularly every local school, the most successful in that community. It also leads when you get school choice, it's true. Schools do get to choose, which is not quite what the intention was, but that already is starting to happen. So let's not ask different kinds of schools. <coughs> just want to show you some stats from that lab. There's the distribution of numeracy across the country. So there's some primary schools. If I now took out the independent schools and graphed them, where do you think they'd go? Yeah. There is no tail. There is no difference. But you know the debate out there, somehow they're better, different. Uh -uh. Not a scrap of evidence, but the myth is perpetuated that somehow the grass is greener. And if you actually look at the cost differences, it's quite huge in terms of the fundings. And this notion of retention rates. And you can see since 1995, we've hardly changed. Thank goodness for our Aboriginal students. We're getting much better at finding ways to retain them, and that's the blue line. I saw one on five in Star High School don't finish. As a parent, I was very much driven by Henry Levin's research. He's an economist of education. And what he showed is that the best predictor of adult wealth, health, and happiness was not achievement in school. It was the number of years of schooling. So how do we make our schools inviting for all kids to stay on? I'm sure many of you, like me, have children of your own, and when you have a number of them, or four, four is the number, the variance is quite large, right? Oh, I've got large variance. And one of my kids, you know, school was okay for him, he enjoyed going to school, um, can say he was going to go on and, and be Einstein, nah, it's not going to happen, he loved uh, his sport too much. <clears throat> and I was very pleased that when he got to year 10 equivalent, his school found ways to feed his obsession with water polo. And they made him run the sports academy and do the business and have to do the maths to do that. And he finished year 12. He then, because his father was quite insistent that he stay in this business called schooling, couldn't find much at the time we were living in New Zealand, in both the polytech se sector and certainly not in the university sector. So he applied and he won a water polo scholarship to go to a community college in the US. We don't have that concept here. I think it's a major, major loss for so many of our kids. And a community college is kind of like an undergraduate university. And if he'd been successful after two years, particularly given his water polo, he would have transferred to UCLA. He decided after a couple of years to come back. But my point is, 
There are ways you can keep all kinds of kids in this business called schooling. But what's the message we tell them all the time? If you're not bright, you can't stay here. If you're not going to go into university, you can't stay here. And I was involved in my New Zealand days in trying to address this problem head on. And believe it or not, we had a lot of troubles trying to change the year 11 and 12 curriculum. Not only did the universities not want that to happen, but many of the teachers did not want that to happen. They were very comfortable keeping their best students and focusing narrowly on those students, and the rest can leave, thank you very much. And Mr. Bellino quotes the figure. In fact, I did fact check it last week. He's right. 98% of adults in prison in Victoria did not finish high school. The cost to them in society is huge. And so what we did in New Zealand is we, we tried about half a dozen things, quite frankly they all failed, but the one that really made the difference is we got to the point of saying about a year 11 and 12 curriculum, stop. Let's not listen to the universities and some of those teachers who privilege a narrow count. And let's ask the question, how can we make every kid strive for excellence? No matter whether they're doing panel beating, water polo, or baristaship, or physics, or chemistry, or history. And so we said, very simply, to every subject, if you can come up with an assessment at year 12 that can reliably distinguish between excellence, achieve, so excellence, merit, achieved, and not achieved, we'll include you in the final year assessment. Wow. The language teacher said, can't do it. All our students are excellent. I said, fine, you're out. And the panel beater said, no, 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 it's pass file. And we said, fine, you can do that. You're out. Within a couple of years, every subject was able to come up with an assessment that distinguished between excellent, merit, achieved, and not achieved. And the retention rate went, within three years, from 80% to 92%. And you know where that extra 12% came from. A huge change. It dramatically changed how the high school teachers taught those subjects. Suddenly they were no longer the judges and saying, well, there's an external exam you have to pass, to my job is to help you get excellent. And given what happened there, you can safely go around any school in New Zealand and the concept of excellent and merit and achieved in every subject is extremely similar, no small feat. But mostly the message was to kids, like my kid, you're not just doing water polo and running the sports academy, you can do it at excellent merit, achieved or not achieved. There was something to strive for within the notions of excellence. Come on Australia, our upper school curriculum is killing us. And I know it's not going to happen easily to have a national curriculum in that area because every state tells me they're perfect and just follow us. But we can't keep going having the top to our school system that's throttling us on what really matters. The retention rate, that last 20% is worth fighting for. And we have to find ways, not only in the last two years, but in the two years after, to find ways to keep those people in this thing called learning. If you leave school at age 16, 17 now, by age 30, your, limit, your options are so incredibly narrow. And I have to ask this question, and it's, it's a question, I don't tweet it and say I said it, I'll get in trouble. But my job, one of the major focuses in Aitzel at the moment is implementing the TMAG recommendations, the teacher education recommendations. Here's a question for you. How many teacher education programs are there in Australia right now? Uh, 386. That's good, last year it was 420, so something's happening. 85,000 students are in teacher education at this moment, and there are 7,000 jobs, and most of those are part-time contract jobs. You know the debates about how to fix it. There's been 101 reviews of teacher education in states, territories, and the federal government over the last 50 years. 101 reviews. And you know what's happened to all those reviews? Nothing. The TMAG report was quite different. And its message is we kind of don't care about your entry. We kind of don't care 
about what you teach them. We kind of don't care how many hours they spend out in schools. We kind of don't care who you are out in schools doing it. We kind of don't care about those things. All we care about is the same that we've been asking you for the last 10 years. Can you put evidence on the table that your graduates can change the learning lives of students? How did they lose that? <laughs> but we're not responsible for them once they go out. We train them, they're brilliant. You mess them up in the schools. And what do you say? Oh, they were poorly trained. In fact, 60 to 70% of you say they were not well trained. And we need to fix them up. That debate on both sides is helping no one. The deficit thinking helps no one. What a novel idea to ask tertiary institutions to follow their students through to see, firstly, the nature of the positions they get, how well they get, and maybe even be involved in residency models or following through. Why can't we ask them to look at what they're doing whilst they have them? Queensland's interesting. It's decided that it's going to get its nine providers, its nine universities together to come up with a common form to look at their final practicum. Practic because certainly when I pointed out two years ago, across those 400 programs across Australia, there wasn't any common assessment. Wow, bonkers. Now they've done it. Unfortunately, not a single item in that last prac asks anything about the impact on students. But asks things like, do they teach the right way? Do they give the right amount of feedback? Do they use the right assessment? Do they give engagement? All important prerequisites to the important question. Now right at the moment where one and a half years through our implementation, it will be done by December in the first uh, tranche of what's happening. It's caused a lot of angst out there. It's caught a deputation to come to my Vice-Chancellor to fire me, not that it's got anything to do with it. So I know it's hurting the business model. And I'm asking you to think, when you have teacher education students in your schools, how do you help them understand their impact on kids? Yes, they have to do all those other things, but surely they're the precursors. So I need your help in this debate. I need your help when you actually come up with the evaluation that maybe even sometimes getting the kids involved in what that impact of that teacher, that new teacher is. We ask that of you, you student voice. How do we find other ways? Here's the problem. <coughs> if we don't fix this problem, we're going to go the same way the UK has done. And what the UK did about four years ago is they said, stop. It's not working. We're going to take the money off the universities and we're going to give the money to the schools to train the students. You wanting to do it? Now, many schools in the UK loved it. Now, the government loves you doing it because you're a lot cheaper than the universities. And many schools started to do it, still doing it to this day. Now, they had to have some relationship to the university, but they held the purse strings. Right? This year, for the first time in decades, England is trying to import teachers. The supply has just can't kind of make sense. Can you imagine in your school, I'm going to give you a brand new student from day one. What happens when they front up to that first class and they're hopeless? You get rid of them, as you should. But unfortunately, you don't replace them. Hence, the dry up supply problem. One of the good news about tertiary institutions, each year 30,000 start and 15,000 complete. Hopefully we get rid of the right half. But you don't. You get rid of them, but you don't replace them. So be wary of that. Be wary of what the Americans are doing. They now allow anybody to set up a teacher education program without accreditation. And there's an organisation of non-accredited teacher education institutions in the United States, and at this stage, when I checked the other day, there's 665 members. Oh, do we really want to tell our community that this is an amateur game? That anybody after a few weeks can go out and be a teacher? I don't think so. I don't think that's valuing expertise. So be careful, and I say to the committee of deans each time I meet them, if you don't help us implement this current legislation, I can write the 103rd report. That will be taking the money off the tertiaries. It may be giving it to you. So be careful what you ask for. If you think you have a supply problem now, just ask to run teacher education. <coughs> it's something we need to fix. I don't want the message to be, if you're dumb, you can be a teacher. 
I want the message to be the opposite. And just in case last year I said that and the Sydney Morning Herald quoted me the first half of that. Chair of Aitzel says if you can dumb you can be a teacher. I did not. I said the opposite. I don't want that to be the message. But unfortunately, if you look at the evidence at the moment, all you need to become a teacher in a teacher education institution is a wallet. I don't think that's good enough. And yes, 16 years ago, Australia was much further up that curve in terms of the equity stakes. <clears throat> we're slipping back dramatically, hence the residualisation. And we're getting very dangerous territory in terms of the haves and the have-nots. And certainly if I look at Brexit, when you look at the analysis of those polls, it wasn't left or right. It wasn't Liberal Labor. It was the haves and the have-nots. I don't need to remind you the most famous statement that Mr Trump has made. I love the poorly educated. And he was serious. And I've lived in the States and the South of the States for many years. And I've got a bottle of very expensive red wine on the fact that he will win because there's more have-nots than there are haves. I'm looking forward to giving that bottle of red wine away, not that I'm going to reveal my politics. But it's a pretty scary situation when you have a school system that starts to residualise and what its ultimate effect is on the nature of the politics in the country. And don't tell me it's the refugee kids, because they actually outscore our local kids. And I want to specifically look for a moment at the Aboriginal kids. There's the distribution across Australia at our, our primary schools, our West secondary. And the thing I want to highlight here is how we have to stop the rhetoric about the tail. Because I'm a hell of a lot on the tail. Of course we all worry about the tail. I also worry about the other tail. The other rhetoric we have to stop is the gap. Because I ask you, tell me where the gap is there. Where is it? There's two. And I struggle to find in Australia anybody who cares about the Aboriginal kids above the average, and there's just as many above their average and below, that's what an average is in the population, who's worried about those Aboriginal kids that are going to go on and lead our nation, be our doctors, our lawyers, our engineers, our nurses, our teachers. All the rhetoric is that we talk about Aboriginal underachievement, which surely is the most racist term we have. We have many Aboriginal kids. <clears throat> you can do stunning pieces of work at the top end of the distribution too. And when I look at Cape York schools, Noel Pearson schools, it's really an interesting debate. And many years ago when I met Noel, he told me all about his method, which some of you know is direct instruction, which many teachers hate. And I said to him, Noel, Direct instruction is a high probability intervention, yes, but it's the wrong debate. The debate is the impact on the kids. And if you're not having a high impact on the kids from a high intervention program, stop it. And he said, well, my struggle is I can't get anyone to do an analysis of my data. I said, oh, come on. What a silly statement that was, I said. So he gave me all his data. And five, six years ago when he started, his kids, on average, were making three months gain for a year's input. Pretty hopeless. Now, they're making two to three years gain compared to the national average, the blue. Which I think is pretty impressive. And then when I reported back to Noel, I said, look, you've got a great story, but if your kids are going to catch up, they need to make five years gain for a year's input to catch up. But let's not knock the success. So I find it quite intriguing over the last few months when there was a riot in Arakoon that had nothing to do with the school itself, except there were mainly the young teenagers who didn't go on to high school. Six years ago, three kids from that community, four schools went to high schools, now 57 do. Is it enough? No. Is it a dramatic change? Yes. And so the debate came out, and as some of you know, the report was the problem for the riot was because the schools used direct instruction. Wow. And so what I'm asking you to think about is stop debating how you teach. Stop getting up and saying, we teach this way, therefore it's good. Kind of, let's get honest, guys. Who cares a damn how you teach? All we should care about is the impact of that teaching. 
provided it's not immoral. And how do we look at schools that are having stunning success? And I also find it intriguing out there that many of the critics of that area are people who are running similar programs in other schools nearby. They call it something different, explicit instruction, explicit direct instruction, you name it. Oh, we're different. I don't care. How do we make sure, and this is my point, how do we make sure when we have our debates in our communities, it's a function of our success in changing the learning lives of students? We're very good at it. And certainly what we've been doing now is the Northern Territory came to us a few years ago and said, hey, we have an issue. You know the issue. It's tough up there. You know, the average tenure of a teacher and a principal in the Northern Territory is eight months. Turnover is dramatic. We also know that there's some pretty stunning teachers up there. And I went up in the first year and I spoke to a group like this of principals, and it was really interesting what their narrative was. They talked about their social, their sports, and all the other stuff. Now, they talked about their schools, but they talked about, well, we do this, and we do this. And I went into one school, and they had a big barn. And the principal talked me through, he said, oh, this is the principal four times ago, four years ago. <clears throat> he was in the canoes, there's all the canoes. And this is the principal three years ago, he's in the bicycles, there's all the bicycles. And so on, he went around. I said, well, what are you doing? So I'm in the laptops. They don't learn, do they? All the peripheral stuff. And so what they asked us to do <clears throat> was, would we take over some schools and work with them in Central Australia? Now, the first thing I know about this business is beware of educators with solutions. They're everywhere. I'm sure every workshop you'll ever go to, you've got some educators saying, this is what we do, and you should do it too. Have your warning bells go off. Many times those solutions don't fix the issues you have. So the first thing we did is we went in and did a good old-fashioned needs analysis. Yeah, we got a fancy name for it. We call it the Visible Learning Matrix. And we look at a whole lot of things. There's a bit of an example up there. And we've got four or five answers uh, in terms of what we know works over the time, but we didn't work to that. We also use a, a kind of a traffic light. In the Northern Territory, there are four colours on the traffic lights. And in our first year, you can see that when you map across all the schools in the central, not a very healthy picture. And what we do then is we work with those schools and say, now, across the dimensions, which particular program are you going to put in place? Let's get real, guys. When you're going to put a program in place in a school, the answer is one or two, it's not 15 or 20. The number of schools I go into that have 60 or 70 interventions in their school, hoping like hang that the drip theory will work. How do you get a focus, focus, focus? What was it like? Three years, and now we're across the whole of the territory. But my point is, you can make dramatic change at a system level. And so when I look around this room, and principals of Victoria, and each of you sitting there with your school, and you've got a day or so here at this conference, how do you create a common narrative? Because when you go to that principals conference now in, in Darwin, which I went to not so long ago, they are now talking about what does impact mean in your school? What are examples of what a year's growth looks like? The debate was dramatically changed amongst the principals. Well, you're trying that and you've got that kind of effect. And it kind of reminds me of what Andrew Slyker talks about in the days before PISA, when 100 ministers of education used to meet in a conference like this. And wow, was that Ed talks on steroids? Because every one of them got up and said, we're doing this, it's wonderful. Once the PISA results came out, about 60 countries sat down and shut up and realised they didn't have evidence of impact. So how do we privilege that evidence of impact as they're starting to do, as you can see there in the territory? You can change whole systems collaboratively. So let's come to the reboot. And I certainly want to highlight this notion of identifying and valuing expertise. And some of you have seen this kind of chart before when I put these up. And these are, I would argue, amongst the common, most common things that we debate in our community, in amongst our politicians, <clears throat> and in our schools. And you know the results. They're trivial. They hardly matter. Not one of those. There's not one structural issue in schools that's above the average. How do we allow that to dominate our debates? And if I walked around the schools, if I walked around your schools, 
I would suggest that it's dominated, but you need this resource, you need this tool, you need this tip, you need the structure. You need fewer kids in the class, you need ability groupings, you need another curriculum, you need all this stuff. Look at the contrast. And my point is if we don't acknowledge, reliably identify, and esteem expertise, we're going to lose the game. We're going to fund trillions of dollars on what doesn't matter. How do we diverse, we reverse that trend? and get our resources spent on that which truly matters. We have four steps in the professional standards for teachers. And last year, I wrote to all the highly accomplished and lead teachers in Australia, 300 of them, and I invited them to a workshop in Adelaide earlier this year. And they nearly all came. How many from Victoria came? Because you don't have the system. Oh, but we use the Australian professional standards in our own school, which is why 99.97% get annual increments, which is just not credible. But across the rest of them they came, and we asked them quite often during the two days we were with them, how can we best help you? And what do you think their answer was? How do you think we can best help highly accomplished and lead teachers? It's a pretty despairing answer, I have to say. Continually, they said, wouldn't it be nice if our principals recognised us? Wouldn't it be nice if they'd come up and congratulate us? Wouldn't it be nice if they found a way they could use us? Wow, that's a pretty damning indictment, guys. We don't know how to use the expertise around us. Oh yeah, we use the experience around us, and there's nothing wrong with experience. We want experience too. The problem is the correlation between experience and expertise after five years of the job is zero. And the point that I want to do is I want to raise this notion of highly accomplished and lead teachers, and yes, some people don't like the acronym HOLTS, but invent a better one. How do we make sure there's at least one of those in every school? How do we make sure that we use them alongside our role as the principal, to get them to be involved a bit more with the graduate and proficient, to move them up the, up the scale. How can we, as we've done in our evaluations of AIDS, look at the biggest problem in our schools is teachers after 10 years, it's flat. Now that doesn't mean to say it's bad, maybe flat up there, but we're not adding value to enough of them. But there's some stunning highly accomplished and lead teachers out there. And certainly what I want to do in my role in ANSTL over the next two years is to privilege this debate about what impact means, what a year's growth looks like, what expertise is. And I want to privilege highly accomplished and lead teachers. And I'm delighted that New South Wales and South Australia have solved the performance pay issue. They're not doing this crazy thing that is commonly debated about performance pay, you pay on the result of kids' test scores. Can you imagine in the medical profession if we paid surgeons on the basis of how many people they kept alive? Who would deal with sick kids anymore? No, you turn it on its head, you do what every other profession is. And what New South Wales and South Australia are now doing is they're advertising positions that you can't apply for unless you're highly accomplished and lead teacher. And the pay follows. And a really interesting question for you to think about, I'm not advocating this, I'm asking you to think about this. Principals, are you prepared to have a lead teacher in your school that's paid as much or more than you are? Interesting question. I'm not advocating it, I'm saying it's, it's a question on the table. There can be multiple ways to be excellent in a school. And how can we privilege and use the expertise that's around us? Now the key to me is, these halts are reliably identified. They're not on the basis of attestation, which privileges the experience and the social yet. It's how can we reliably identify them on the basis of their impact on kids? And certainly as we found in the work I did for the National Board in the US, that sometimes when you identified them, many other teachers were a little disparaging. Oh, you're the one that got the certificate, you do the work. Well, no, we have to find ways to esteem those. Because that's the nature of not only our business, that's the nature of how we can convince our funders and our parents and our community that we do have expertise in our system. And in the same way, I don't want it to be, and here's the hard part, I don't want it to be that a parent comes 
up to you and says, oh look, my kid's not with a high income, she's a lead teacher, I'm not happy. In the same way that when you go to your GP, you say, well, you're not a surgeon, you're not, you're not good enough. There's a place for every one of them in that system. And we have to make sure that we leave no one behind in this debate about expertise. But we are a profession that learns. I find it quite fascinating that doctors call what they do the practice of medicine. The thing that scared me the most was the Reddit report a few years ago when Margaret went out and asked hundreds if not thousands of first year teachers, what's the thing that helps you most become a teacher? And within six months, over 90% said, just leave me alone in my own class. Wow, we have failed the profession dramatically. And there's a new number one, invisible learning. The effect size of 1.57, top of the pops. Teachers collective efficacy. And here's your job principles. How do you get the belief in your school amongst all your adults that they can change the learning lives of students? Now, it's more than that. It's the faculty as a whole can organise and execute the actions required to have a positive effect. And that demands, I would argue, that we do attribute success to teachers. Now, it doesn't take us a few seconds to attribute blame to teachers. Don't go there. That's not high collective efficacy. It's privileging on the basis of reliable identification, the excellence that we have in our schools attributed to teachers. It is succeeding in success school in other schools. And in our own network of schools that we run at the University of Melbourne, we have now four networks, um, 85 schools. I have to say, the thing that probably delighted me most last year was one school, one of our richest schools here in Melbourne, I, got, I was going to say hire a bus, no, they own the bus, took their bus out to a very small country, low decile socioeconomic school, to look at their writing program. Because they'd all put their evidence on the table about their writing program and realised, hey, this particular school is having stunning success. What's going on? They went on the basis of evidence, and that is evidence into action. We didn't go because we liked the sound of it. Oh, you're doing that's interesting. Or someone said in a research article that was a good program. They looked at the impact of kids. And then they went out and had a look. And yes, you do need to be persuaded by credible and trustworthy persuaders. And the trustworthy, I would argue, is a function of people who can demonstrate that before, in other schools, they were able to change the impact on the learning lives of kids. Not, this is a new glossy, a new website, or a new app. And yes, it is about the joy and the thrill. If you spent $100,000 of your money on improving your own teaching next year, who would notice? We've got to have a joy and excitement about the success that we have in our system and our improvement. And the subjective norms. Wow, that staff room is very powerful at raising or lowering the collective efficacy of teachers. What's the debate in your staff room? So then we did analysis of um, conversations at morning tea, lunchtime, and professional development. It was dominated by kids, curriculum, assessments, and kicking footballs. In the early days, we found one minute a month teachers talked about teaching, and obviously even less about their impact of teaching. How do you make that the norm, as it now is in the territory schools, to talk about impact, and to make it safe, and to build the trust to do that? And you can't keep maintaining the efficacy unless you feed the expectations with evidence that it actually is making a difference. So my new mind frame is I collaborate. And how much collaboration and narrative do we have in our schools? I want to mention Revolution School for a moment. And I understand Michael's here. Where? And I hope many of you watched it. I've got all the ratings from the ABC. It was a reasonably highly rated program. But what they were surprised about is that it's one of the largest downloads on iView almost in their history. The number of people going back to see it. And it's really interesting to hear the reaction out there. I must say I was a bit nervous after the first program. In fact, I was nervous right through the whole setting. And let me give absolute credit here. All I did was I did a commentary on the film. The school made the changes themselves. And all credit to them. And can you imagine if the ABC came to you and said, we're going to stick three camera people in your school every day for a year. We're going to have fixed cameras in your offices. And you have no control over the story and the editing. Wow. 
I was nervous too. And the first program, I thought, oh no, people are going to say, who would want to send their kids to a school like that? Because obviously they're trying to show in the first program it wasn't as rosy as it could be. But no, that was not the reaction at all. The reaction out there was, wow, we didn't know you had to put up with this. We didn't realise that you have a passion for changing kids' lives. We didn't realise that you not only had to deal with the kids, you had to deal with some very interesting parents. We had no understanding that you would go to this extra length. You had no understanding this is what you talked about. And here's my point, Matt. I think you've got a major role to educate parents about what learning looks like in our schools, about what expertise looks like in our schools. If parents are watching that program, some of them within 10 or 15 years are coming out of school and they've already forgotten, well, let's be honest, virtually none of them have looked in the school through the eyes of a teacher or a principal. How do we get them to realise what stunning things happen? And that was the message that came out of Cambria, that stunning things are happening. Now you can imagine I wasn't prepared to even be involved in that school until they put their data on the table. If any school comes to me, and many do, I'm a great school, come and see what I do. I'm not interested in seeing what you do. I'm interested in what your impact is. This is the survey that the ABC did as part of the Revolution School where they asked a 1,000 adults. And I took the data and I split it between adults who had kids in schools and adults who didn't. It made no difference. And you look down that list of what they want are the highest influences. And hey, you saw the chart before, they're all close to zero. Who did the politicians listen to? The voters. Who are the voters? These people. You've got a major role to educate our parents about where our resources should go. Because if our resources keep going into these things, putting flagpoles in schools and all the other stuff, that money is not going to other things. And so we are appeasing the parents. Now let's be careful. In the UK, four weeks ago, they did a similar survey with teachers, and the list was the same. We've got a major job. The money is following what people are asking for. And they're asking, I would argue, for the wrong stuff. Here's Cambria five years ago. Kids loved coming to school to be with their mates, very motivated to do that. And you can see down there in terms of the, the learning in the bottom 10, 15%, pretty toxic. What was it like five years later? Still loved coming to school, but look at the difference. What an incredible turnaround. And as Michael would say, and I'm sure he will say this, but he speaks tomorrow, but if he doesn't, let me say it for him. And there are many schools like this that use evidence to change the nature of what happens in their school, I would argue, with stunning results. So the narrative I want to change is how do we get away from this notion of high achievement? And our current debate is we want schools up there. No, I want along the bottom as well. I want progress as well. I want to steam those schools that have high progress. And yes, when I talk to politicians and principals, they say, yeah, I agree. And then you walk out of their office, and they say, oh, you want high achievement. And yes, we can label those, those um, quadrants. And the challenge I ask for every one of you in the room is, where are you? What I want to change, I want to change the message that those are our best schools, because I would argue they're not our best schools. High achieving schools are not necessarily our best schools. If you're cruising, you're not good enough. I want to change it. These are our best schools. And for those of you in low socioeconomic areas, you can be at a stunning school. And in a high SES, if you're in the cruising schools, wow, I'm not convinced. And let me look at some data. Here's year seven to nine reading. Now, this is across Australia. And you can see the incredible number of schools that are still cruising. Hey, we don't have many schools in this bottom quadrant, which is good news. But we are much more successful with our kids below average than above average. And then we look now specifically at Victoria and numeracy. That won't let me go there. There we go, thank you. Again, if you look at the success of those quadrants, we have a lot of reason to be very, very, very happy. 60 to 70%, but the 20 to 30% that are not it's our high achieving cruising schools. Where are you? And my point is, this is the problem we have to solve. We're not solving the problem down here, which everyone thinks, oh, those terrible schools, low achieving, low progress. We hardly have any of them. 
How do we esteem that excellence over there? By constantly saying, if you're above the average, you're doing a good job, is allowing Australia to be blind to its biggest problem. Cruising kids and cruising schools. And this, as uh, John Amy and others have done when they have analysed PISA, that backwardness I showed you at the beginning, the major reason we're going backwards is because of our cruising schools. I want to have a debate, as I'm trying to do now with the CARA and other groups and with the government. How do we get teachers better resourced to understand progress? Like, isn't it ironic that you have at your fingertips thousands, if not tens of thousands, of measures of achievement? But how many measures of growth do you have? In terms of knowing whether you're adding that year's growth for years ago. We can turn that around and give schools access to that. How do we resource for expertise? And making sure we don't give our money to more structural things. To appeasing the parents, and sometimes the teachers, who want all those structural things. When the biggest cost is expertise, finding the time and the resources to do the collaborative planning, collaborative evaluation, going into each other's classes to see the impact on kids. Remember, 80% of what happens in a teacher's class they don't see or hear. So we need better ways to help them understand and work together in a climate of incredibly high trust. Certainly, doing more of the same and investing more in what we've been doing will allow us to continue to go backwards. And sooner or later, someone will say the emperor has no clothes. And someone will go back. And unfortunately, someone will go back, but it won't be me. Can we go back? Thanks, guys. One more. Someone will say, hey, we've got a terrible system. We don't have a terrible system. We have 60 to 70 percent up there that I think are doing a stunning job. We have pockets of problems, and I would like to argue this morning, we're not bad at diagnosing where they are. So my aim is how do we change the narrative? How do we change it from that politics of distraction to the politics of collaborative action, collaborative expertise? And I really want to put the word collaborative in it. We can't pick one school off at a time. It's interesting working with South Australia at the moment. They've realised they've spent all their time trying to go out and do one school at a time. They've set up networks which are geographic, which is kind of bonkers because every August those geographical networks are competing. They set up networks where they said, we're going to go in and set up, they have coals, or we have seals, they have coals, they have different jargon. And those people went in and said, here's the solution, we're going to apply it again. Well, they're even asking whether the problem that they're wanting to fix is related to the, to the solution they have. And I worry about here in Victoria, where we have our seals, that if they come in and say, here's what we're going to do, we're going to be this kind of school, that kind of school. Once again, we're going to miss the opportunity to collaborate. And how do you get across our schools, principals, having a trusting environment so you can share your evidence, so you can then talk about how we can increase the teachers and the adults' collective efficacy in the school. Not, I come out and say, look, come and look at all the wonderful things we're doing. But look at our evidence. We've got great here, we're not so good here. Oh, you're pretty good there. How can we share? How can we get that collaborative expertise going? Because that, I would argue, is where our future lies. That's where, I would argue, the majority of people in our business why? I don't think I've met a teacher yet, have you, who came into this profession for any other reason than they wanted to have an impact on kids. Let's feed the impact. Let's have the debate of how we move from progress to achievement. Let's build the evaluative capacity, not only in our schools, across our schools, and in organisations like this, to recognise and esteem that excellence that is all around us. Our biggest problem is complacency. Thank you.